Um, so yeah, I'm uh, going to talk a bit about the CFS scheduler. Um, a decidedly not real-time scheduler. Um, and I'm Peter Shostra. Um, together with Ingo Molnar, I maintain this stuff. I work for it. Um, so there's Scheduler, as uh, the previous speaker mentioned. It runs pretty much every task on your system except those few odd balls. Um, there is no limit on the number of tasks, and therefore we cannot make any guarantees whatsoever. Um, and we're optimized for throughput, um, as already said. Um, so it's a completely fair scheduler, although you can argue about the complete uh, <laughs> part of it. <laughs> um, but as opposed to the old 01 scheduler, which was a heuristic nightmare with cliff edge behavior and, and all kinds of funny cases, this one is pretty good. Um, it's mostly fair in that it doesn't allow starvation. There are some edge cases, but they're very hard to trigger. Um, and it provides equal CPU time to equal tasks under most normal situations. Um, so the basis for the whole idea is the, is the weighted fair queuing um, scheduling paradigm. And it's implemented as a virtual runtime scheduler. So the increase in your <coughs> virtual runtime is the actual time divided by the weight. If the weight is 1, which is nice 0, um, it's all the same. Um, We've got here two tasks, one with a higher weight that will be a lower nice value. Um, each arrow represents, say, one millisecond of runtime. And you see this task has double the weight. That this, uh, if this is one, then this would be a weight two. And it gets to run twice for this one. It's fairly simple. As already mentioned, we track all this in a red-black tree. Um, and the leftmost task is the task that has run least. So that's typically the one we, we um, pick. Um, on insertion, we also keep track of the leftmost task so that we do not need to do the old um, log n uh, RV tree traversal to find the leftmost task. We do need to log n insertion and removal upon um, picking a task and, and uh, returning it to the queue. Um, the current running task is not actually in the queue. Um, for um, performance reasons, uh, the, the tick method, where we every millisecond or so, the, the periodic system tick, we update statistics. If the task, if the current running task would be in the queue, we'd have to take it out update its time, and put it back into the right spot. Um, but since that's all pointless, we decided not to put it in and only. Um, so, so when we select the task, we take it out of the queue, and we keep it out. We just update the statistics at the tick. And when we're done running it, when it blocks or we get preempted, we put it back in and we take another one. So we track time in nanoseconds. Um, and I can talk a whole long while on the joys of timekeeping on a particular CPU. Intel is really good at this. <laughs> um, we store time in a U64, and that's a big number. In nanoseconds, that's about 585 years worth of time, which you think would be good, except remember that division. Um, I think our minimum, so we, we do fixed points, because floating point in the kernel is not good. We do fixed points, and we, we have a 10-bit um, fixed point range. And the effective least weight is 1, 5, 12. So the, the minimum weight is 2, which gets you 1, 5, 12. So that reduces to one year, more or less. Computers are known to run that long, so we need to take account of wrapping. 
and that gets us a whole different problem. Um, so U64 or any um, computer word, or, uh, as we know, is, is a modular space. Um, C, as a programming language, does not say it is so, but we all know it is. Um, and since we're working with computers and not some arbitrarily defined language, <laughs> we rely on what the compiler actually does and on how the computer works and not what the language specification says, so we ignore C. Um, but yeah, it's undefined behavior. Your compiler is, in principle, free to screw you all. We use GCC, and there might be one or two other compilers that can actually compile the kernel, and they better do this right, otherwise we're host. Um, because we, we rely on overflow behavior a lot. So we rely that if you take 2 to the 64th minus 1, the maximum value in a U64, and at 1, you get 0. And no funny signals in other business. So it, it cleanly wraps around. So if we go further and we get here the maximum value, we flip over to 0 and we start again. So these tasks, they, they will get real time and they will queue. And, and we're all the way there. And then we flip over. But is that task that we just ran then the one that had the least time? Or should we pick that one? But that's the largest value. So how do we deal with that? Um, and that's what min v runtime is for. It's, it's um, a virtual zero. It recalibrates to zero point, and it basically tracks the minimum v runtime in the queue. It's not the absolute minimum, because of other problems. Um, so there, there is a filter in there, but it basically tracks the tail of the queue. And if you then um, subtract the actual uh, uh, the min v runtime from your actual v runtime, you get a recalibrated tree, and the overflow goes away, unless your spread of v runtime exceeds 2 to the power of 63, and then we're host. Um, that doesn't happen frequently. I hope. Um, so on slice and preemption, it's a time-sharing thing. Um, we would like uh, the impression that multiple tasks run at the same time and not be stuck like, when does my X task get to run again? Um, so we try and run each task once under the human perception limit. And that is around 5 millis or something. Um, we play tricks with this on SMP systems. On SMP systems, we do a statistical thing and we say um, it's more likely that, that we one of the CPUs will schedule within this time, so you get a higher chance of context switches and at least something changes. So we then grow this um, number in a logarithmic fashion, log n. So for two CPUs, you get um, double. For four CPUs, you get again double that. For eight CPUs, you get again double the value. Um, so the first point, we try and run each task below the human perception limit with this multiplication factor for S&P. At some point, if you have too many tasks, you're slicing too fine and you're hurting from that. So at some point, we have a minimum slice and we say, well, too bad, and we go grow the entire slice, um, or the, the entire period to the minimum slice time, the number of, of runnable tasks. And we ignore nice and wait here. We just take number running and, and don't do weight-based uh, things, because that's too complex. Um, so what do you do when a new task comes in? Um, there is the zero lag point. Um, that comes from the scaling theory of weight, uh, the, the proportional fair queuing theory and all that. It is the point. Um, of average free runtime, basically. But we can't compute that because that would involve a division and a big sum, and that's all expensive, so we don't do that. Um, we basically guesstimate something at the min v runtime plus 
the period we just computed, as that is about where all of the current tasks would have run once, and then we insert it there. And that more or less works. So you penalize the new tasks. They don't get to run immediately. Um, but they're out in the future a bit if your spread is indeed one period, which isn't always true. Um, there's the fair sleepers thing that Ingo came up with. Um, so if you do a proper, completely fair scheduler, um, and you have a task that runs 50% of the time, and you have a task that runs 100% of the time, and you combine them, you get a one to two ratio. So the 50% task gets to one run third of the time, and the other one gets to run two thirds of the time. He thought, well, you've got the two tasks. That should be 50-50, wouldn't it? I mean, one was already running 50. So um, we have the fair sleepers thing, which is obviously not fair. <laughs> but it makes for better behavior under certain circumstances. And um, we basically have a threshold and that says, uh, if you sleep within this period, we, we ignore your sleep time and we assume you're running. And that is the, the regular wake up preemption threshold, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then there is wake up preemption. So if we place a new task, should that new task preempt the other one, uh, the one that is currently running? Um, what we do is we compare the virtual run times of them, and we say if the new one is um, far enough to the left of the current one, it can preempt. Otherwise, we'll continue running with them. And that's, again, a configurable threshold. And here we do play a bit of games with the weight. And we use the wrong weight explicitly. Um, the wrong one is not its own, but the current one. And anyways, we, we do it such, and there's a comment in the code, that we penalize light tasks over heavy tasks. So heavy tasks preempt sooner, um, and light tasks preempt later. Um, So there's buddies. Um, and that, again, destroys the whole big leftmost thing. Suppose you have three pairs of client-server tasks. So tasks that basically ping-pong some workload, synchronous workload, and three pairs of them. If you would do a strict leftmost, you would pick one of them, then the other. And you interleave. You completely shred all the pairs, um, and there is no cache affinity whatsoever. So what we say is it would be good if we could let one pair get ahead of the bunch up until the regular preemption point, and then let another pair catch up to the preemption point, and then let a third pair catch up to the preemption point, and then start the whole game over again. Um, so this is a pure throughput thing. Um, and we have three classes of bodies. We have the previous body. So when we switch tasks, we keep track of the last known task. And when the current task falls over or goes to sleep, um, we see if the previous task is within the preemption region at the leftmost part of the tree. If it is within that region, we pick it and not the leftmost task. If it is too far to the right, well, too bad. The next same thing, um, that's the task that just got woken. Um, so we have SCAT features. And this one is typically disabled. We found a number of workloads that don't really uh, like this. Um, and it didn't hurt too much if you have the previous one enabled. But you can enable this. We still use it for C groups. And once we get to there and there's still time, I can explain you why we do. Um, and there is the skip thing. Um, so anybody using sket yield for anything other than sket FIFO, maybe sket round robin, should be slack. Um, POSIX says that sket yield is undefined behavior for anything other than those two classes. But people like to call it anyway. So we need to do something. 
we say try and not run this task as long as it's not too far behind. There you go. So one question about this body. I mean, do you do this uh, like just pair of tasks or also even like three tasks, like you know, one, two, three, one? So we just keep the one point, okay. and so whatever works. Um, if so, if it's if it's three tasks that wake each other in a circle, they'll work just fine. If it's one task that wakes two one others, one. varies. Um, but it is fairly typical. Um, even if there is multiple, and but if it's synchronous communication, that there is multiple communications between uh, the server and a particular client. For example, the X protocol has for a very long time been a synchronous protocol. So then one client does a lot of X requests, has to X, X overrun, return, does another one, return. So it, it still works. The asynchronous stuff, not so much, but... Um, So then there is the SMV uh, misery. As already said yesterday, it's difficult to find a unit processor system these days. I think this one has four cores in it. Back when we all started doing computer stuff, <laughs> we'd be happy with one, but these days, not so much. Um, so disregarding the whole power aware scheduling thing, um, that doesn't exist, so we're not going to talk about it at the moment. <laughs> Maybe if there's time left. Um, we try to be more conserving. So we try and get every single CPU running, if at all possible. Screw fairness. Just get them to run. Um, once we have them all running, and we get multiple tasks, we try and preserve fairness. Um, in that we try and get um, every task its relative runtime compared to other tasks. Of course, there is uh, infeasible weight scenarios and all that funny stuff, um, but we try anyway. So there's the load balancing that does this. There's the periodic slow load balance that is in the busy systems. Everything's running, and every so often we come around and try and move tasks around to make this S&P nice thing work. Um, then there's the idle load balance. That is, if a large number of CPUs is idle, they'll occasion, or, well, they used to wake themselves, but these days we, we ship it off to a separate CPU that isn't idle, but does it on their behalf. But we'll look to see if we can steal some work somewhere. And this is infrequent, but we do it <laughs> to try and pull some work to them. And then there's the new idle load balance. And that is, whenever a CPU goes idle, we try and s see if there's work elsewhere that we can steal so we won't go idle, um, because going idle is not good. Um, of course, there's a whole bunch of problems with that. If we spend more time looking for work than we were idle, we've lost. Um, so recently, HP did a whole bunch of work um, to both improve the idle guesstimator that estimates how long we will be idle and keep track of the various phases of new idle load balancing, how long it takes. And when these values get close, we just abort and continue. Um, and we'll get to, to uh, topology later. Um, event balancing, event-based balancing. So there's various events on which we balance actively. <coughs> XEC and Fork are one or two, actually. Um, so they're rare. Um, so we can spend a little extra time. And on those two, we basically do a full search for the least loaded CPU um, and ship the task off. Um, on wake up, wake ups are fairly common. And they should be relatively fast. Otherwise, people get real cranky. So we only look at at the CPU that it used to run on and the CPU that woke it up. They need not necessarily be the same. Wake up fine um, is a feature where we try and pull the, the task towards the waking CPU because apparently the CPU that woke it has data for it. Um, and we, we check if we won't 
um, disturb the balance too much. So if it creates a big imbalance, we won't. Otherwise, we will. Um, and then there is select idle siblings. We do that on either way. Um, and we basically look in our uh, last level cache domain, which gets bigger and bigger, which is why this is a problem. Um, if there is a idle CPU to be found in that cache domain, if so, run it there instead of the actual CPU we picked. Um, it's difficult um, for a number of reasons. One is SMT. Um, so we prefer, if there's not enough tasks, to only have a single thread of a core running so that the core is only the one thread and then get other cores running before using the sibling threads. Because if you run two sibling threads, you share core resources, and that's bad for performance. Um, that makes it a bit icky. And as I said, uh, Intel keeps growing and growing the number of cores in a cache domain. Um, they're up to 12, I think. So if you have to then look at all those CPUs, <laughs> that's a lot of remote cache misses on an L2 levels. And it's still hurting. Um, we're not sure what to do. If you just shoot that function in the head, a lot of benchmarks hurt. But other various benchmarks hurt because it's too big. So one step forward, <laughs> one step back, you can't win this game. Um, and then, as I said, on sleep, we do the new idle thing if we just win idle. Um, so the periodic balancing, the one where we try and even unload. We strive for the above equation where the total weight of CPU1 divided by the compute capacity of that CPU is equal to that of another, where i is not j. So we try and um, make it all very nice and equal. But there's a compute capacity. We haven't talked about that yet. Um, so on traditional computers, all CPUs run at the same speed and have the same compute capacity. Um, <clears throat> but then there is interrupt overhead that can take time away. Sometimes that is a very significant chunk of time. There is the real-time tasks that can run and take ta uh, time away from our fair tasks. And there is people like ARM that think it's cute to uh, put different cores on the cache coherent domain and call it SMP. Um, so these cores cannot ever match compute capacity. So we model that with the, with the B thing. Um, for interrupts in real time, we just take a, a historical average. It's a, it's a windowed average of the recent use time by these two things and um, basically reduce our capacity pro rata. Um, then we have to talk about topology um, systems aren't simple anymore. We've got the SMT already mentioned, then we've got the cores. Um, AMD likes um, to do shared cores, so they have a shared level 2 and a shared instruction decode pass. Um, there's the L3 cache domain, which they all have, which is the last level cache typically on the modern systems. Um, then you have the NUMA nodes, which on the Intel are typically the L3 domain, but you can have different distances. Um, and you get an entire topology domain. So we, the, the SCAD domains already mentioned is how we represent this. We build a tree of all the domains. Um, it's typically logarithmic because um, one level up always contains various numbers of the one below, at least two. Otherwise, there's no point of having a layer on top. Um, and what we do, we load balance bottom up from that tree. So for SMT, we look, is there something in our sibling? Then we go one level up, and we look, is there something in our shared cache domain? And we go another level up, is there something to be had across our nodes? Is there, and then across another NUMA distance, and eventually across the entire system. This, of course, easily gets to be a quadric time endeavor which is not cool. So what we do is we, every time we step up, we reduce the frequency, and we reduce the number of CPUs that does it. 
uh, we only have the first CPU of the particular domain go up one level and we reduce the frequency and thereby if you do this some we get a constant time um, load balancing. Um, the side effect is, is that the convergence time gets larger. That, that grows an extra few terms. Um, C groups. They're a friggin' nightmare. Um, they're all cool and ideas. Um, yay, let's have a bunch of related tasks, stuff them in a group, and do hierarchical scheduling. Except SP. On UP, this would all be fantastic. And that is the same thing with real time scheduling. UP is good. Um, except, of course, nobody has one anymore. So we, we already mentioned the, the, the weight of a CPU, and that's basically the sum of the weight of all the tasks on it. Um, and for regular SMP, that's a straight sum of local variables. All the tasks that run on that CPU are on that CPU, so we can easily compute this, and this is good. For C groups, that's not so good. Um, so um, the way it's defined is a group has a weight equal to one task on that same level. So on SMP, say uh, some tasks of the groups are on this CPU and some other tasks are on this CPU, then we need to divide the weight of the group as relative to the level above between those two CPUs. And we do this pro rata, depending on the weights. But then we need to know the total weight of the tasks within that group. But because there are cross numerous CPUs, that's not a local property anymore. So you get to compute global sums to make local decisions, and we don't like that. Um, that's the problem. So we, we went through various iterations of that. We, or at least me, did the initial implementation that was really sucky, but it worked. It just did the global sums. Um, and people complained that if they ran this on their 16 core system, it would tank. And if they run that on their 64 CPU systems, it will basically make no progress whatsoever. Um, right. So um, at some point, me and Paul Turner um, decided to track averages across the CPUs. And that worked a whole lot better. Um, and then Paul Turner did a per, per task uh, accounting. Um, and then we basically track each individual task's history. And uh, we track the runnable average per task. So that is the time that a task is runnable. It is not the same as running. So you get queuing effects in here. So the, the runnable thing, if you do the sum, will eventually end up at uh, number of tasks times the weight. Um, <coughs> and that's good, because that's the same thing we had previously. Um, but if it's less, that's also good, because that's a more uh, accurate reflection of, of utilization. Um, we do per C group aggregation. Um, Every time the local sum diverges enough from the previous local sum, we fold it back into a global per C group state. Um, I said global. Yes, it still hurts. Um, we had reports on people with 80 cores, 160 cores, and it says, ow. We haven't come up with anything better. The current solution is to put this word where we overflow in, in its own cache line. That makes it slightly better due to less false sharing. Um, the advantage of the per task accounting over the per CPU averages we had is migrations. Every time a task moves from one CPU to another, we can instantly migrate its load to the other side. Um, previously, we had these averages adjust. So if there's a lot of task hopping around, which can happen, um, all the averages will fluctuate and typically vastly overestimate the load and you get inferior performance. By being able to migrate the load around, you get far uh, quicker convergence um, 
and that works pretty good. But like I said, it, it all still hurts a bit. Um, yeah, I think that, I don't know, we've got one more. Let, but let me uh, get back to the next body. Um, so picking a next task for C groups is basically an hierarchical thing. You pick an entity. Is the entity a task? Well, you're done. Is the entity a group? You do the thing again. Inside a group, pick another entity and pick another entity. So you can go down a bit. So when we then put the task, we have to undo the whole hierarchy and then go down again, find another task, and then go up again. Um, and you might have noticed that doing all that stuff endlessly might hurt a bit. It does. So um, what Google came up with, um, I'm not entirely sure who that was, might, might have been Paul, was um, use the next thing for it. And, and no, so what Google did is, is do the same, make sure you always pick the same group, and then have groups make some progress, and then pick the next group and, and make them some progress. And what I recently did um, is avoid the whole up and down dance. Um, since we already picked the next group, we know we're going to end up here anyway. So if we do indeed end up here, we can avoid putting the next task, or at least the levels above it, because we're going to retake the many uh, again. So I avoid a lot of up and down and only pick the bottom level um, where possible. And that's what we always use the next body for. And that worked real well. I had a pipe test in a um, pipe test is two tasks that flip one bit over a Unix pipe. It schedules a lot. Um, and I ran that in, in a three C group level deep thing versus in the root C group. And that was a big performance difference. Um, I'd have to look up the numbers, but it might have been 7 or 10% or something like that. Um, and with this optimization of not constantly putting and getting the entire hierarchy that close to get pretty good. Um, um, as already mentioned yesterday, there is bandwidth control for CFS. This comes from the cloudy people. Um, but there is no task limit, as stated earlier, and there is proportional fairness. So it's an upper bound. If there's enough tasks, the bandwidth limit will never be reached. And so it's, it's only if, if an upper bound. If there's not enough tasks, and you could actually consume that much CPU time, you're clipped. But other than that, it's not. So these people want to charge by the cycle or something silly like that. They say, well, if you want to use all my computers, if you can, har har, um, we'll charge you more bucks for it. Um, there were some bugs with it recently. <laughs> Still need to fix those. Um, we more or less worked around them, so it should be good, but we found bugs in the timer subsystem, which we need to think about a bit more. Um, and that's it, pretty much. There is endlessly more details. Um, anybody got questions that I can elaborate on? Yeah. Or are we all bored city? Thank you, Peter. Well. Directly control the weight of uh, each single task, or, uh, or not? There's the the nice value. It's it's all mapped to a nice. Uh, um, okay. But uh, I think the nice nice uh, that I have uh, some kind of mapping uh, to some way, so you yeah. cannot directly choose. Okay. No, for the C groups, we can set the weight. Okay. Um, in in the fixed point ten bit thing, so one twenty four is one, mm -hmm. and you can go up to. I forgot what the limit and down to two. Um, and yeah, that's it, but, but not for tasks. That's just a nice level. Okay. Thank you. And that's from minus 19 up to 20. And you'd have to look at the table. Ingo did some nice math. And I think for every three levels, you lose 
ten percent or something relative to the other. I forgot. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. I do have a question. A question from somebody who, I mean, who saw the last line of C code maybe 10 years ago or so. Maybe. But let me just ask you, my impression is that this scheduling algorithm has, has a lot of you know, um, hidden insights that, you know, okay, you, you have some reports from somebody say that something is going wrong, you try to fix it somehow without, uh, you know, breaking what was working before. So, I mean, the question that comes to mind is, I mean, is it possible to bring all this magic number, all this tunable feature out to some, I don't want to say user space, but some space which is configurable somehow? So and then you just you know, have a text file that you, okay, for my computer, these three, five, you know, whatever, whatever works, and I compile the kernel and I live with that. And for this, you know. So if you compile with SCAD debug, um, a config scat we debug. Most of the random numbers we pick, like the, the human perception limit, the, the preemption granularity, <coughs> um, all, all those numbers, there are exposed oh. in, in, in proc, sys, kernel, oh, okay. scat, underscore, oh. whatever. So you, you can play Good. with them. Oh. And there is in slash debug is a scat underscore features file, and that has a number of knobs. It's, it's not an API. People shouldn't use it. But if you're developing a kernel and you build a feature, it's, it's easy to put a toggle in to, to run your benchmark, turn it off, run the benchmark again, uh -huh. and see what the difference is, if there's a difference. Uh, okay, doesn't always work. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Uh, but yeah, what you say, if, if you fix one thing, another thing breaks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we already touched upon this. It's impossible to make the perfect thing that yeah. works for everybody. Yeah. We generally. Um, try and, and um, aim for a middle road. If there is a large performance increase for a particular workload with very small decrease in others, we might go for it. Mm -hmm. But it's always a bit yeah. swinging back and it's, forth. Yeah. It's, it's an endless hurt game. There is no joy. Yeah, sure. It's <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah, I understand. It's, it's clear. Okay. Okay. Well, so I mean, I think we can take a break, and maybe we can start again. Um, a quarter to 